All right, Baruch Hashem. Well, welcome to the part two of the class on conversion, talking about the dynamics and pitfalls of conversion. So today I just want to continue um, more or less where we left off last week, and I want to share some quotes with you because I, just, I think it's important that we understand the Jewish mind and why it is that there are uh, issues with this, with, this, with this topic of conversion. I was speaking to a first-time guest this morning, and the person was saying that they've been gone to some other congregations, and they're coming here, and they're just seeking truth because the message that's out there is quite confusing. And it is confusing. It is very confusing. And, and I guess from my point of view, I, I'm saddened that it's so confusing because when you just follow Scripture coupled with Jewish halakha and tradition, it's really not that confusing. But it's sad that it has to be so, especially in the Messianic world. So I want to speak to you a little bit about the three areas that we have to deal with when we're talking about Yeshua-centered Judaism. And what we're talking about here at Sar Shalom is that people are coming in and being converted to Yeshua-centered Judaism. And most, most especially... Uh, non-Jewish people. But as I've said before, it's not limited to non-Jewish people. If somebody is of Jewish birth, we still would expect them to go through a mikvah. That's exactly what the apostles talked about when they said that be baptized for the remission of your sins. The only reason somebody went to a baptism, uh, except for issues of Tameh, which is uh, impurity, other than that, if you went to the mikvah, it was because you were going there to convert. And that was the baptism that Yochanan the Immerser was talking about when he said to come and be immersed, mikvahed, for the remission of your sins. So anyway, what are the three areas, what are the three types of people that we have to contend with? And I use that word contend for lack of a better word. I, don't, I really don't want to be, um, uh, what's the word? I don't want to be combative. There's really, life is too short to be combative. I'm not interested in debating people. No one has asked me to debate them, but if they did, I'd probably turn them down. Not because I was afraid, but, but rather because I think debating is, is quite pointless. Okay, it, There's no sense in it. Listen, if Hashem is drawing you here, fantastic. And if He's not, He will soon. So, you know, you might as well just kind of enjoy life. You know, no sense in debating. I'm not going to change your mind. You're most certainly not going to change mine. So it's really kind of pointless. And I think that sometimes, not always, but sometimes we get into debates because of arrogance and pride, you know. And I don't, I'm just not into that. Not that, I'm not, not that I don't struggle with pride. I think we all do. But I would rather work on being humble, okay? So anyway, what are the three groups? So the three groups are this. First of all, you have Christians. And God loves Christians. We have a great relationship with EBC Church. It's fantastic. They're fantastic people. They are... Um, a bit of a blank slate, and I don't mean that derogatory. I just simply mean that they, they have never heard. I'm talking about generally. They've never heard of Passover. They don't know anything. They don't know. I was putting up mezuzahs the other day, um, and one of their elders came in. He asked me what I was doing. Just curious. You know, he's very kind. We've talked many times. He said, what are you doing? He said, we're putting up a mezuzah. They had never heard of that before. So I had the opportunity to tell them what a mezuzah was and show them the scriptures and show them the little parchment I was rolling up. It's fantastic. You know, it's wonderful. But painting, painting with a broad brush, uh, Christianity generally has said that um, they believed in, in uh, supersessionism, replacement theology. We talked about last week what we defined what replacement theology was. So you have those group of people who they don't, they don't understand that it doesn't comprehend that we believe in Messiah and yet we follow the law. That's like a dichotomy in that world. Then you have Messianic Judaism, which, again, painting with a broad brush. If you're somebody watching online and you say, well, I'm not that kind of Messianic, um, that's great. Just understand that I'm painting here in generalities. But Messianic Judaism, to a large extent, is basically Christianity without the replacement theology. Okay? Um, and then, so you have those Messianic Judaism that says the Torah is for Jews and it's not for Gentiles, which I 100% agree. I 100% agree with that. The Torah is not for Gentiles. That didn't even make sense at all. The Torah is not for Gentiles. Why do I say that? Because the Torah is for those who are in covenant. If you're in covenant, you're not a Gentile. So the Torah is not for you. 
So uh, if you're a Gentile, that means you haven't accepted Messiah, you're not believing the God of Israel. Think about this. If you're, if you're a non-Jewish person by birth, and you say, I believe in the God of Israel, and I believe in the Messiah of Israel, and I follow the Torah of Israel, but I don't want to be a Jew. Think about that for a second. Does that make any sense whatsoever? And it doesn't at all. But we're going to soon find out there's a, there's a very simple path to becoming a Jew, and it's not anywhere near what people think. And then the third group is Jewish people. Jewish people who would confront you, so to speak, and say, well, your, your, um, your conversion was not valid. Let me tell you a story about that, by the way. There was a, there's a couple in our synagogue who visited a Orthodox synagogue um, a year or so ago, and they did not want to cause any problems. They didn't want to cause any issues. They were just going there to visit. They had a specific purpose why they were going there. And uh, let me follow, let me, before I tell you that part, let me tell you the part the day before. The day before, they wanted to meet a particular well-known rabbi who happened to be in the United States at the time. This family went there. The father of the family walked in. They were going there. He wasn't really the one who wanted the meeting. It was somebody else. So he went there. And this rabbi, assuming that they were Jewish, halakhically Jewish, okay, made the assumption. But this rabbi evidently operates in the prophetic. He's not a believer in Messiah, operates in the prophetic, Okay. So this family walks in, he sees the father, and he says, Hashem is showing me that, that what, your, what your Hebrew name is supposed to be. I, I came here, I'm bringing my family here, I'm not even, you know. Well, this particular gentleman was Torah keeping and had been coming to Sar Shalom for some time. So this, this rabbi looked at him and said, you've got a Jewish soul. And I'm seeing that your name is supposed to be et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I don't want to give away anybody. Your name is supposed to be so-and-so. At that time, he wasn't going by that. So the man said, okay. So he called me and asked me what I thought. And I said, you know what? If it's from Hashem, take it, you know? (laughs) So he thought about it, prayed about it, took it, okay? The next day, the family goes to shul. The family did not want to make any issues. Again, they were trying to be respectful. So they just said, oh, the rabbi said, you, tomorrow, you need to read. You need to be one of the readers from the Bema. Wow. Okay. So they arrived early to prepare and find out, you know, protocol. Well, the Gabai of the synagogue, who was not there at that meeting, said, are you Jewish? Just standard question. And the man said, well, yes, but we're convert, converts to Judaism. And the, the goodbye said, Orthodox Judaism? And he said, well, we converted under conservative auspices. Again, not trying to be dishonest, but didn't want to bring Yeshua into it. To, didn't want to bring a, a problem, you know? So the goodbye said, I'm so sorry, you can't read. You, you have to be Orthodox conversion to read. Uh, they don't, we don't recognize conservative conversion as valid. Now, it's instructive. It's instructive because many people in this room would think, well, if I go through conversion through Yeshua, it won't be received. We've had people, only one family that I can think of, maybe two in the past, that have, uh, in my opinion, got their eyes off of Hashem and decided they want to go through traditional conversion. So they leave Shar Shalom because, you know, our conversion is not valid because we are in Yeshua. They end up going to a conservative synagogue. But the irony of that is their conversion is not valid either. That's the irony. And that's what I'm trying to tell you, okay? In Judaism, it's very, very, um, it can be very, very tribal. If you haven't converted under this rabbi, it's not. Even in Orthodox Judaism, you think, well, I'll just go out and get any Orthodox rabbi to convert me and I'll be good to go. Not necessarily. There is a list, a literal list in Israel of approved rabbis. And unless you go to that rabbi, forget it. 
You can be Orthodox, you can be a member of the Rabbinical Council of America and still not have a valid conversion. I'm just telling you, okay? And this is why it's important to get off of Google and and talk (laughs) about what's real, okay? So anyway, so this, this man was upset, of course, hurt. Understandably so, I would too. So the rabbi who named him the night before... You've got a Jewish soul. Hashem has shown me that your name is da 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 da. That rabbi comes in because that rabbi was going to be uh, basically a guest speaker that day. So he meets him at the door and he says, I'm, Here's the deal. I, I was going to read because you said you wanted me to read. But they won't let me because my, or, my conversion was Orthodox. I mean, excuse me, was conservative. And the rabbi said, Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm so sorry. Now, friends, I want you to think about that for a second. That rabbi under the Ruach HaKodesh had said, you're a Jew and here's your name and I want you to read. Now, because there's not a piece of paper, now there's not a piece of paper, it's not valid. I'm sorry. Was the Ruach there last night? See, either one or two things are true. Either you're a false prophet and you need to be rebuked and kicked out of the shul right now or the halakha needs to be adjusted. Now that's just a fact of life. That's a real life story. That's a story that I personally am involved in. That's what I'm talking about. That's when the rules of men... Now I'm all about tradition. I mean, if you look at my life, you come to my house, I have no problem with tradition. 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 It's my favorite song in that movie. My favorite song. I have no problem whatsoever. I'm not one of these guys that tradition is a men. Yeah, men like Zach, Zachariah, Haggai, Mordecai, those kinds of men. I have no problem with that at all. However, I do believe, like Mashiach taught, there can come that point where you cross that line. And I believe that's one of those lines. So, the, the moral of the story is that we have to go... By, there's another book. We have to go by what, what Hashem wants in our life. Uh. I had an encounter this week. It was a wonderful encounter. It's an interesting encounter. There's a supermarket that we shop at near my house. Twice. It's been a long time since this has happened, but twice at this supermarket, I have run into Israelis. And I was wearing a t- I was wearing my, uh, not a t-shirt, but I was wearing my golf shirt that's got the Lapid logo on it, and it just says in Hebrew, Lapid. And it's kind of funky. It's like a big, you know, big Lamed, you know, on Lapid. If you don't read Hebrew, even if you read Hebrew, it would be kind of hard to read at a, at a, you know, from a distance. So we're walking in this supermarket, and there's this couple. They didn't look Israeli to me, but okay. So we're walking, and Rebbe Sina and I are walking past. And as we were passing them, I overheard the man say, Lapid. <laughs> and it caught me by surprise, because I'm in a supermarket. I don't expect Hebrew. <laughs> and I thought, as a split second, I thought, if somebody can read this shirt, they're really good at Hebrew. Especially if we're just walking past. Anyway, it turns out the Israeli. And um, we got to speaking to them. And the wife uh, was talking to my wife. She spoke very broken he- English. The husband was a bit better. Um, but she would ask a question in Hebrew, and, and I could understand enough to go ahead and answer the question in English. But uh, he spoke Hebrew to us initially, and then I told him in, in Hebrew that we'd be better at speaking English, so that was great. So she was looking at my wife and saying, wow, you're so beautiful. you got such a great spirit. Wow, beautiful, gorgeous you are, my wife, you know. And the husband was like, hey, what's up, you know. <laughs> so uh, we were chatting a little bit, and they, of course, you know, I mean, it was late at night. We was, it was one of those things you would go and buy, pick up some groceries on the way home. We've got seat seat and keep it on and everything, of course. They don't. He doesn't. She's not covered. He, you know, they just look like average, you know, Joes and so on. So they said, we, we've been going to Chabad, but it's so far. Where's your shul? I said, our shul's in Saginaw. Saginaw. They said, are you, are you Orthodox? The rabbit scene said, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> and they said, do you do Pesach? I said, of course, Pesach. I said, Purim, too, you know. So uh, I, said, I said, now look, we believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. So the couple said, well, okay, okay, okay. So they said, Yehudim Nazrim. You know, like Nazarenes, Jewish Nazarenes. I said, Ken, you 
know, I believe in Yeshua. And they said, well, that's not our path. And I said, okay. And they said, but you know what? Look, there, in Judaism, there's all kinds. There's this, there's that. There's, you know, it's all the kinds. I said, okay, fine. It's fine, it's fine. Before that, though, they wanted, our, they wanted our email address and our website address and all that kind of stuff. So I'd given it to them already. The man, as he's kind of pushing his cart away, he was getting nervous. He was pushing his cart away. I said, look, I'm tired. I'm looking for a kosher beer. Can we get this? <laughs> Purim is coming, okay? So the man looked it over his shoulder. He says, at Pesach, you mentioned Jesus? And I said, I looked at him and I said, Jesus? Lo, Yeshua can. And he looked at me like, and his wife started speaking Hebrew to him. He's like, Yehudim Nazarim. You know, like, like you got to understand the difference here. They're not, they're not Christians. They're Jews who believe in Yeshua. So it was an interesting encounter. But the point is, is that they accepted us as fully Jewish. They didn't pull any of that shenanigans. I mean, <laughs> and I often wonder what it must be thinking. You know, he's not wearing tzitzit, he's not wearing kippah, it's nothing. But yet we are. We believe in Yeshua. So it's interesting. Who knows what Yeshua is going to do with that? You know, may he, may he bring their, uh, open their eyes. Bring him here, Baruch Hashem. They got the website, right? <laughs> so the idea is, you know, we teach that Torah is not for Gentiles. Torah is for those who are in covenant. Now, we happen to believe that the Torah needs to go out to the entire world. The, the world needs to be brought in. That, in fact, the reason we say that is because that's what Isaiah teaches. Now, someone else this week sent me a message. And they said, well, what do you answer when somebody brings up and they quoted some, one of Paul's letters? And I said, oh, well, that's the old, that's the old uh, to quote Inspector Clouseau, uh, that is the old, the Apostle Paul ploy, right? <laughs> that's the uh, impas- Apostle Paul ploy. <laughs> you got to watch the Pink Panther and know what I'm talking about there. Well, look. I told this person, listen, the Apostle Shaul, I have no problems with the letters of Shaul. I, they've been grossly misunderstood in the Christian circles and Messianic circles. The problem, if I can use that word, in Christian circles and Messianic circles is that at the end of the day, their entire theology is based on his letters. Whenever somebody comes up to you and says, well, what about 1 Corinthians? Or what about Romans? Or what about da 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 they are starting with the premise of Paul is the source, the, capital T-H-E, the source of Halakha. And Paul can never, ever, 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 ever be the source of Halakha. He, his letters can be used to support Halakha, but he can never be the source of Halakha. The source of Halakha has to first begin with the Torah. Amen. Then the prophets, and the, you know, the Messiah's words, and then you know, rabbinic writings that go on for thousands of years. And, you know, you can incorporate Shaul's letters in there. But you can never say, well, this is what the Torah says. And then if somebody comes up and says, well, what about Paul? That right then it betrays the reality that somebody is, is following after the writings of Paul. And you can't do that. First of all, in 90, I don't know what the percentage is, but 80 or 90% of the time, we don't even know what Paul was talking about. We have the foggiest idea of the question he was answering. How in the world can we make a halakhic decision on a conversation? We only have half the conversation. And besides that, someone said, well, you know, uh, quoting from, I think it was 1 Corinthians 7, or if I'm not mistaken, it's talking about uh, the person should remain in the condition they find themselves in when they're... Really? They should remain single? If they're saved single, they should never get married ever? Now listen... Circumcision is a commandment. It's, therefore, if it's a commandment, it's not optional. And if, I don't believe it's true, but if the apostle ever in his life ever said that he nullified a command of God in his teaching, he's a heretic. That's just, there's really no, that's just the end of discussion. If somebody is sold out and says, well, the, the apostle Paul said that you shouldn't get circumcised, for instance, I'd say, well, he's a heretic. I can, now, as many of you know, I love history. I don't claim to be a historical expert. That's why I study history. But history will show you that every tyrant who's ever lived, who's tried to remove the Jewish people from the face of the earth, they always begin with one of two things. And that is, A, they forbid Torah in general, and more especially, they forbid circumcision. 
you name any tyrant, name any, any Russian communist or Nazi uh, national socialist, name anybody who's ever tried to defeat the Jewish people to include uh, the Greeks during the, the times of the Hasmoneans. And they always try to get rid of circumcision. Circumcision is number one on the hit list of the enemy. Is that the side do you think God is on? If God was going to raise up an apostle later on in life to rid the world of circumcision, then why in the world did he condemn these other empires who took circumcision away from the Jewish people? You'd think that God would reward that. You'd think that God would reward Hitler. He would reward Stalin. He would reward Antiochus Epiphanes for following the will of God. But when you line up all the who's who of those who try to get rid of circumcision, you find out that it's a laundry list of the most evil people in history. So you have to ask yourself, just, see, this is what I love about Judaism. Is it is as much theological as it is just common sense. Just common sense. Looking at it for what it is and going, wow, this is, this is interesting. So uh, why is it then that we have all these issues in, with these different groups, some of it is theological, some of it, especially when dealing with Jewish people, and this would include Messianic Jewish people, some of it is just what I would just call a psychosis, a psychosis of prejudice and so on. Let me read something here, and hopefully this will bring some clarity. This comes from, again, from the book Opening the Gates by Gary Tobin. It says, the threat when a non-Jewish partner, it's talking about two people who are married, one is Jewish and one is not Jewish, but they're married, okay? The threat when a non-Jewish partner journeys towards Judaism can be the threat of exposure of the Jewish partner's lack of knowledge about Judaism or lack of religious commitment. Conversion is a religious process. Many born Jews see Jews by choice as being better Jews, for their religious observance and knowledge, even if they themselves have no desire to adopt the religious practice of their spouses. Now, out of, a, out of necessity, I just, I just feel compelled to expose to you the, the struggles behind the curtain. Because for three years, I had the opportunity to attend Messianic Jewish luncheons and there was mess, obviously Messianic Jewish leaders there, at least from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but we had people come from time to time from other areas. And I will tell you that around that table, most, if not all, the people who were there were just absolutely, positively not observant. They did not eat kosher. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of them ate pork, but some of them did. But none of them ate kosher. Some of those rabbis would very openly, after Shabbat service was over, They'd gather up their friends and go to El Chico and have beef and cheese enchiladas on Shabbat. None of them wore tzitzit. Some of them wore kippah. They did the festivals and stuff. I mean, you got to do that if you're going to win Jews. You say, you're being harsh. No, I'm just being honest. Just being honest. Somebody told me one time, as a Messianic Jewish leader, they didn't like how I was talking on Facebook. I was bringing up these kind of topics. Ah, oh, you're speaking evil about the Messianic community. Now listen, if there was a church, and there are, in Dallas-Fort Worth that believe in, in supporting openly gay couples and so on, if I stood up in the pulpit as a pastor and said, this church over here, first church of the whatever, supports gay marriage and openly accepts gays, why should I be contempt for that? They're, they're advertising that. That's their mission. If I, if I point it out, why am I the, her- why am I the Lashon Hara heretic? I'm just telling you what's, what's the truth of the matter. And the, and the fact of the matter is, is that the, the dirty little secret, if you will, is that when non-Jews come in, all of a sudden they're, they're enthusiastic for the mitzvot. They're eating kosher, like really kosher. And they're wearing seed and so on. It's a threat to these Jews who are Messianic, who have no intention of being observant. They're simply Jewish Christians. And their mission is to bring Jews in and make them Christians. Now, you know, culturally they're Jewish. 
culturally they keep Hanukkah and so on, but it's not, they're not doing it out of sense of this is what Hashem desires and I'm following. It's more of like, no, this is just what Jews do. You understand what I'm saying? And that's why you have to understand because many people who say, well, they, the, the Messianic Judaism says that the, the Torah is for Jews and not for Gentiles, they're getting, they're getting caught in a semantical trap because really they don't think the Torah is for anybody. Really. Now, if you doubt me on that, pick your favorite Messianic rabbi, ask for an appointment, bring a list of questions, and drill down on what their observance is. And you will have them tell you, like I had one of the the largest Messianic synagogues in this area tell me, there is no difference between kosher meat and unkosher meat. Except for the price, he said. <laughs> you say, that's Lashon Haran. No, it's not. I'm just telling you, I'm just being honest with you. The reason I don't view it as Lashon Haran is because I've seen too many people get caught up in this discussion and they don't really, they, all they see is Oz. They, don't, they haven't been behind the curtain. And they're getting led astray. Somebody says that, well, somebody, one Messianic rabbi recently said that Rabbi Mordecai will lead you away from Messiah. Really? You haven't been watching my droshes. But anyway, someone, it's a common thing that in Messianic Judaism to say, well, if you get too observant, you'll eventually be led away from Messiah. What does that say about Messiah? Think about that for a second. If you are so, if you get more into the mitzvot, eating kosher, keeping the Sabbath, and so on, and that leads you away from Messiah Yeshua, what does that say about Messiah Yeshua? Somebody also brought up the, the question of, that um, First Roots of Zion has. Someone asked me this week, is this okay? Are y'all getting something out of this? Okay. Somebody asked me the question this week. They said, well, First Roots of Zion has a theology, it's called divine invitation. That Gentiles don't have to keep the, the Torah, but they have kind of a divine invitation. So first of design like encourages them to, to accept the invitation. I said, okay, let's think about that logically. I'm all about logic. Let's, log- let's be logical about this. Now, if I invite you to my house for a party and I invite you, I give you a, a, a Griffin invitation, and you say no to the invitation, okay. You, you can't come. You're washing your beard that day, whatever. You know? <laughs> It's all good. I was looking at Menashe when I said that. It's a, it's a long process. No pun intended. So if you don't come to my party, but I've invited you, okay, whatever. But what does it say to the king if the king invites you to his table and you say no? What message are you sending the king? So my question to the, to the, to the questioner was, if the king of kings sends you an invitation, should you accept it? If you say no to the invitation, what are you telling the king of kings? If somebody got an invitation from God, please come eat with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever opens with me, I will come in and sup with him. Who would say no to that? A fool, right? And, but we're playing this off as if we have a choice. See, sometimes when the king asks you to do something, he's not really asking. He's not really asking. When you, it's a good, uh, uh, Hillel, it's a great thing. When you say, uh, Johnny, would you please clean your room? Well, you asked about cleaning. it. I'm so sorry. I was not asking you. Your parents ever do that? They discipline you in syllables? <laughs> My parents used to do that. My mom and dad both. <laughs> it says here in this book also, it says, The Jewish spouse is not the only family barrier. Sometimes Jewish in-laws reject non-Jewish spouses, even if they convert, because their heart of, in their heart of hearts, Jews by choice can never be real Jews. And by extension, the grandchildren are not really Jewish. This is the blood barrier sentiment, quote unquote. 
See, there is a theology. See, this is what I'm trying to tell you. This is why books like Opening the Gates are so important. This helps you to understand that there is a real psychosis that exists. And when you, when you interact with that, that crazy Jewish person, whether they be messianic or otherwise, and they're just, they're just you know petulant and they're stomping their feet in the ground and saying, you're not a Jew. You realize, I understand, it's okay. I understand where you're coming from and there's medication for that. <laughs> this author says, yes, yet many ask biological Jews how they view converts and they describe them in the same regard as Pat Buchanan had for immigrants. They, they're everywhere and there's not anything we can do about it and they have nothing good to, to add. I said earlier that the word orthodox, we'll come back to that in a second. I said earlier that the word orthodox did not exist until after the reform movement. There was another word that was used, a title, if you will, that was orthodox. The other one I like a whole lot, and I've started to kind of use it with us. Because orthodox nowadays is kind of ambiguous, and it's kind of weird. And By the way, just as a, if you're watching online, especially if you're in the house, if somebody is born Jewish, particularly if they're Israeli, and they say, I grew up in an Orthodox home or an observant home or a Jewish home. Many people who don't come from Jewish backgrounds, they swoon when they hear that. Oh, they grew up in a Jewish home. <laughs> they grew up Orthodox. They grew up observant. Don't swoon. Ask a next question. <laughs> Did y'all eat kosher? Were you Shomrei Mitzvot? Were you Shomer Shabbos? Did your mother wear a tekel? Did you wear a seat seat? Because you will be shocked to find that that Jewish person, especially that Israeli, they're like, no. But it's just like in America. I had a, I had a friend one time who was the, the biggest retro, reprobate this side of the Pecos River. Okay? Good. He's a friend of mine, and we, we were professional friends. He's a reprobate. This guy was no more Christian than the man on the moon. But when people would ask him about his religion, he would always say, I'm a Baptist. And he would say that, and I'd look at him like, boy, howdy, you ain't no more Baptist than the... So it's kind of a thing. So when you meet Israelis and Jewish people, kind of orthodox is kind of the thing they throw out. No one advertises their reform. I know one Israeli who berates everybody for not being really Jewish. He was, he's been living in the United States since he was 16 years old. But he was, he's Israeli. Okay. You've been here most of your life. I'm just saying, don't swoon. Just ask questions because it's instructive. Okay. So the question, oh, the, the other word. So instead of orthodox, the other word that was used that didn't catch on was Torah true. Torah true. It just didn't catch on like Orthodox did, but Torah true was another title that was used to insinuate that we're not reformed, we're Torah true. Now, why was that used? Well, let's explore what it meant to be reformed, okay? I said earlier that reform meant that, does not mean, rather, that you just, you know, you don't eat kosher. It's deeper than that. Yes, they're not very observant. But the question is, why aren't they observant? What's the root of it? Let's get to the root problem. So this is a quote. The, the rabbi, this is another book that's wonderful to get, by the way. It's good reading. It's not a very big book. It's called Choosing to be Jewish by Rabbi Mark Angel. Now, this is a book by an Orthodox Sephardic rabbi who is encouraging the Jewish world, just like in this other book, Opening the Gates, to be more open to conversion. The difference between the two is that Opening the Gates accepts basically all branches of Judaism's conversions. We just want to get non-Jews in. Rabbi Mark Angel is saying it needs to be halakhic. It needs to be orthodox. But at the same time, he's saying bring him in, bring him in, bring him in. So he was having a conference one day. He was a part of a conference that was saying that we want to 
get with the orthodox, or excuse me, the well, all branches, and try to come to some alignment on conversion. Now, here's the deal. At the end of the day, here's the reality, as I shared last week, there's only three things required for conversion, only three by halakha. So when someone asks you, did you have a halakha conversion? If you can answer these three questions, yes, you did. That is, you were circumcised or hatafat dambrit. You went to the mikvah and you offered a sacrifice. Now, obviously, we can't do a sacrifice, right? Now, the fourth thing you could say was that it was all done before a valid Beit Deen. But there is some disagreement about what's a valid Beit Deen. Some say uh, 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 Rambam said a valid Beit Deen could be made up of, of layman Jews. They don't have to be, there's, there's no halakha that says a rabbi has to be part of the Beit Deen. It just has to be three Jewish men who are themselves observant. Some would even say that one of the three or all of the three could be converts. Now, there's people who could disagree with that. But the bottom line is, I, asked, I personally reached out to one of my Orthodox rabbi friends, colleagues, and asked him that question. He says, I don't, I don't see anything that prohibits that. Maybe it's not ideal, but I don't see anything that prohibits it. But the point, in fact, is if you meet these halakhic standards, you've had a halakhic conversion, Okay. So they're trying to get to a consensus, and this is where the wheels fall off. He says, there was a reform rabbi there, and this is what the reform rabbi stated. I don't believe God gave the Torah. How can I ask my converts to believe this? I do not accept the authority of halakha. How can I teach converts to accept it? I do not observe the Sabbath or the dietary laws or ritual purity laws in line with the halakha. How can I expect my converts to accept these observances? Listen to this. I only ask the converts that they adopt a Jewish identity. Now, I say with respect, and I may catch some flack with this, but I really don't care. This is a Messianic Jewish philosophy. We don't keep the halakha... Now, with the exception, I will say this to their credit, Messianic Jews do believe that God gave the Torah and the Torah is divine scripture. Whether or not they follow it is another question, but they do believe it's divine, and I'll give them that. But everything else lines up, they just, just have a Jewish identity. What does that mean? I don't know the answer. Like, how can you have a Jewish identity if you're not living Jewishly? But I, I don't know. I'm, that's, you know. In the Jewish world, there was one, one Rosh Yeshiva, the head of a Yeshiva, said to his students, Do not perform a conversion unless you are willing to bet $100,000 of your own money that the convert will be totally observant of Halakha. Now, that's not Halakha. Because the convert who comes is only told a few mitzvahs to keep. They're not expected to keep all the mitzvot. That would be, frankly, impossible. That same person who wouldn't bet $100,000, I could take my clipboard and within five minutes I could find them in violation of a whole slew of mitzvot. I don't even know the person, but I can just guarantee you I'd be willing to bet $100,000 that I can find violations in their life. It's just the way we humans are. But the point, the reason I mentioned that in this book is because it brings out the stringency that exists in Judaism that the re, it's been, somehow it's been, it's kind of sick, but it's been grafted in, no pun intended, that you can't take in a convert because they're not going to be 100% halakhically perfect when they come up out of the water. Well, what Jew is? Why do you think Chabad exists? Chabad exists because there's thousands and millions of Jews out there in the world that are not observant on any level. So if you have Jews that aren't observant on any level, you see, you see the, this, it's hypocrisy is really what it is. Now, let's, let me read to you something right here. On page 20 of this book, it tells a litany of famous Jews who were converts or the sons of, and daughter, or sons of converts. Converts or, or sons of converts include Onkelos. Remember Targum Onkelos? Famous. The rabbis say today, you should read the Torah twice and Onkelos once. 
the Onkelos translation, the Aramaic translation. Onkelos was a convert. He wrote the Bible. He was a convert. Obadiah the prophet was a convert from, the, from Esau. Uh, Shemaiah and Batalion, those were the two pairs before Hale and Shemaiah. They were converts to Judaism. They led the Jewish world and they were converts. Rabbi Akiva, you ever heard of him? Little, little known rabbi? <laughs> Son of converts. Rabbi Mir, another prominent uh, rabbi of the Talmud who was also a convert. Did you know that Moses was a convert? <laughs> yeah, so was Abraham. You probably didn't know that Moses was a convert, but I'm going to read something. Now, this comes from the Talmud. The Talmud. Now, the Talmud is different from the Midrash Shabbat. The Midrash Shabbat is Agadot. The Talmud does have Agadot in it, but it's really Halakha. The Talmud is like Jewish law. 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 So when you read from the Talmud, it's like super authority, right? So the Talmud says, whoever repudiates... I want you to listen to this. I want you to think about... I want you to channel Acts 15 in your mind right now. Mm, Acts 15. (laughs) Right? Channel it right now. You all know it. If you're watching online, you're not used to Sar Shalom. I have a sense of humor. So, Talmud is Megillah, thank you, it's Tractate Megillah 13a, Tractate Megillah 13a, whoever, say whoever, whoever. now whoever in Hebrew means anybody, <laughs> in Hebrew it says shekol, okay, whoever repudiates idolatry is called Yehudi, a Judite, a Judite. Let me read that again, because some of y'all are like, what? <laughs> whoever, Shekhol, whoever, whoever repudiates idolatry is called a Judite. As it is written regarding Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, There are Judites. They do not serve Nebuchadnezzar's gods. They do not bow down to the golden image you erected. In other words, what the the Talmud is saying here is that whoever abandons idolatry for Hashem has just become a Jew. Now, you're asking yourself, what does this mean about Moses? Moses. Pretty much we could end the class right there, but we're going to keep going. <laughs> now, that, remember I said channel Acts 15. Acts 15 was, can, how can we allow, allow these Gentiles in? They're not even circumcised. And Kepha and Yaakov stand up and say, well, uh, well, first of all, Kepha says, Hashem showed me he gave them their spirit, his spirit. And so what they say is, look, as long as they're willing to do these four things, and all four things have to do with idolatrous practices... In other words, as long as they're willing to do away with idolatry, we accept them in the community because halakhically they're Jewish, even though they haven't yet become circumcised. Why does the verse call her Yehudiah, it says here? Now, who's the her? If she is, in fact, Bisya, the daughter of Pharaoh, as the verse later states, uh uh-oh, I read that like that on purpose. This is talking about Pharaoh's daughter. Now, Pharaoh's daughter is the one who took Moses out of the water. Her name was Bitya. In other words, in Hebrew, Batya. Her name was daughter of God. Why was Pharaoh's daughter called Batya? And the, and the Midrash, or excuse me, I said Midrash. The Talmud here is, calls her a Jewish woman. Yehudiya. The daughter of Pharaoh was Jewish? Yes, according to the, the, the Talmud. Because she repudiated idolatry. As it is written, And the daughter of Pharaoh went down to bathe in the river. 
And Rabbi Yochanan said an explanation of this verse that she went down to cleanse herself from idolatry of her father's house. In other words, that day she went to Mikvah in the river to get rid of the idolatry of her father's house. And guess what happens next? She goes to the river according to the Talmud. (laughs) According to the Talmud, she dips in the river three times, becomes a Jewish woman, and next thing you know, here comes little baby Moshe, and God says, because you've become a Jew, now you can take up my ark. Now you can take up my Torah. Now you become the mother of the the greatest prophet who's ever lived. And guess who he chose? He chose an Egyptian convert. To do that. Someone says you're not valid, you're not, you're not an authentic Jew unless you're born Jewish in a Jewish home and went to a Jewish synagogue. Really? Then Moses' mother, there's a problem. You say, well, that's not really his mama. His mama is really Miriam's mama. Uh-uh. uh-uh, uh-uh. No, 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 no. We about to just blow that up. Rabbi Shimon bin Pazi questions the wording of the verse. Did she bear Moses? <laughs> but she only raised him. She didn't really give birth to him. It's not really Moses' mama. She just raised him. This verse teaches you that whoever raises an orphan boy or girl in his house, Scripture considers it as if they had given birth to him. The moment he was sent downstream, he became an orphan. When Batya, the new convert in the house of Pharaoh, picked him up out of the water, she became halakhically his birth mother. Moses was the son of a convert who brought down the Torah to the whole earth. Now think about this. Abraham himself was a convert who brought the religion of Judaism to the world. Moses is a son of a convert who brought the Torah to the world. And you could almost make the argument that Yeshua was an orphan of sorts. The comments say, she immersed herself for the sake of becoming a proselyte. Morme Sade asked what the purpose of this immersion was, since at that time, that is before the giving of the Torah at Sinai, there was no concept of becoming a Jew through immersion. He suggests that this immersion was of a different nature, namely, the immersion required when one becomes a Baal Teshuvah to cleanse himself of his sins. Wow. Doesn't that sound like the book of Acts to you? Yeah, oh yeah, where was the Beit Deen? That's a good point. The Hazan just asked, where was the Beit Deen? Where was the Beit Deen when Batya? And there wasn't a Beit Deen. And yet Batya was a full Jew. Did you know there wasn't a Beit Deen for Ruth's conversion? Mm-hmm. Ruth is the quintessential convert to Judaism. Yevamot 47a and b. Use Ruth's conversion as the basis for all conversions to happen in the future. And yet, it's completely outside of Halakha. Her conversion did not happen in front of a Beidin. It didn't even involve a mikvah. Or any men whatsoever. She left her home. She said, your people should be my people. Your God should be my God. Wherever you go, I will go. Now, we use that in weddings a lot. Sounds beautiful. Where you go, I will go. (laughs) Of course, we don't ever mention she was talking to her mother-in-law, not her husband. (laughs) But who wants to kill the moment, right? (laughs) That sounds romantic, whatever. But the fact of the matter is the rabbi is right that when she left Moab on her way to uh, Israel, Eretz Israel, to Bethlehem, that Naomi converted her on the way. That she explained some certain mitzvot to her and some hard ones, some difficult ones. And the rabbis comment that the book of Ruth says 
the, the two of them entered Bethlehem. And the rabbis say, why does it say the two of them? And it says the two of them because when she entered Bethlehem, Ruth was as much a Jewess as her mother-in-law, Naomi. Now, it's not scientific, but I calculated that on foot, it would take from Moab to Bethlehem uh, about two weeks. Don't hold me to that. I don't know. About two weeks to walk there. So her conversion process was two weeks long. There's never a mention of a mikvah. In fact, I had one Messianic rabbi on, challenge me on that. Not challenge me directly, but he said, you know, challenging somebody who claimed to have gone through a conversion in Yeshua. They brought up Ruth, and I asked the question. I said, and I was serious, because at that time I was reading Midrash or Bob Ruth and some other sources from Art Scroll. And I said, listen, I've really read through this. I don't find any sources anywhere that say that Ruth had a Beit Deen and that she was even in a mikvah. I can't find any sources anywhere. Can you please cite the source where she had a Beit Deen and a mikvah? It, cricket, cricket, I'm still waiting on that answer. It's been about four months ago. You know why? Because there aren't any sources. Now, if somebody's online, they want to send me one, I'm more than happy to correct myself next week. But I haven't found any. I've read through the entire Midrash Rabbah, almost. Read through Art Scroll's book on Ruth, and there isn't one. The point I'm trying to make is, and, and by the way, she's considered a Jew in every respect. She's the mother of King David. If she's not a Jew, there's a problem. Big issue, not just with the Yeshua, but with Judaism, period. All right. So, are we doing okay? Are we learning something? Okay, good. I'm glad. All right, so let me read another quote from you, or to you, rather. Isn't this amazing? It's amazing. It's amazing. All right. Just to reiterate this point, but Rabbi Angel brings it out. The Talmud states that a person who converts to Judaism is considered as a newborn baby. The convert is the spiritual... Now, this is important. The convert is the spiritual child of Abraham and Sarah. By joining the people of Israel, the convert has, in some essential way, become a new person with a new identity. New person, new identity. This is why when you ask them, this is why I want to teach you to ask questions. I want our synagogue to be made of people who are very astute and very smart and, and uh, could themselves lead a synagogue. And when you're talking to someone, you say they... You're having a nice conversation. Don't get combative with people. No sense for that. If people want to be competitive, just whatever. Just go about your business. But if they're seriously asking, they say, well, you're not a Jew if, you're not, if your mother's not Jewish. Don't just leave it there. Don't just assume that that's true. Let me just reiterate. That is true. But I want you to do is I want you to trace the path. Help them learn something. Say you accept that. Jewish mother is required unless you're a convert. But what makes your Jewish mother Jewish? Well, she had a Jewish mother. Fantastic. What makes her Jewish? Well, her mother's Jewish. That's awesome. What made her Jewish? This is going to get old after a while. <laughs> They're going to probably ask you what's your point. And say, well, the reason is, is because that mother goes all the way back to Sarah. And truth be told, somebody in the line probably was a convert. In fact, the Midrash Rabbah says that all the converts who ever lived, their ancestors nursed by Sarah. Now, it's kind of a graphic story in Midrash Rabbah Breshit, but Sarah was blessed with endowment and she was blessed with a milk that flowed freely. And her milk was so abundant that many of the Gentile women would bring their babies to be nursed by her. Isn't that interesting? They nursed from the sap. And the rabbis write and say that every baby that was nursed from Sarah, their ancestors eventually would become converts because they drank of the sap of Sarah. Isn't that interesting? So the, what Rabbi Mark Angel is, is 
advocating here is that every conversion must be halakhic. Okay? So that's what we're advocating. Every conversion must be halakhic. So um, let me read one more quote here and then we'll, we'll change gears in our few minutes remaining. I don't want anybody to be born. I want you all to come back next week. So this is important for you to know. Because, well, let me just read it and you'll know. The most insidious, this is from the book Opening the Gates. The most insidious and pervasive barrier to a convert's full integration into the Jewish community derives from the passionate and often heated who is a Jew debate. Underlying many of the arguments swirling around in this discussion is the secret conviction that true membership in the Jewish community can only be achieved by birth. All others, all other comers can never be like us, not really, not in their hearts. But we cannot say this out loud. We do not have, any, we do not have to say anything out loud. Converts sense in their hearts without opening, without us opening our mouths. So I just want to point out that to you so that you would understand that there is a real discrimination in the Jewish world and it's just it's a discrimination of, of what I refer to as the blood cult mentality. The blood cult mentality. Unlike many born Jews, he writes, untold numbers of non-Jews would love to be a part of the Jewish people and live a Jewish life. They would love a religion that stresses right behavior over right faith, that teaches one how to incorporate the holy into everyday Jewish life, or everyday life, that stresses a life of the intellect that makes one a member of a people as well as a religion. That is the oldest ongoing civilization in the world that gave the world God and the Ten Commandments, and that through involvement with the Jewish people keeps one passionately involved in the great moral issues of the day from the Middle East to Eastern Europe to relations with Christians and Muslims. Imagine a world in which hundreds, and this is my vision, by the way. Imagine a world in which hundreds of millions of Jews were trying to lead lives in accord with Jewish values. Imagine a world that set aside its preoccupation with money one day a week. Imagine a society in which tens of millions of people really believed that gossiping was wrong, where, sex, where a sex ethic lying between hedonism and sexual repression became the norm where people consulted Jewish laws before entering business deals. Imagine a world that read Isaiah weekly, that studied biblical and other Jewish texts a few hours each week during office hours. See, this is my argument. People say to me, well, what you're teaching is is replacement theology. I've had Messianic rabbis tell me that. I said, they obviously don't understand. They don't know what that means. It's like that movie. I don't think you know what that mood means. It's ridiculous. You keep saying that, but I don't think you know what that means. It's absurd. Imagine what would happen if and we had four or five hundred people who were coming to Sar Shalom every week and who lived in and around Saginaw. Do you understand what that would mean? That would mean that the local Albertsons over here or the local H-E-B would soon have a giant kosher section, that there would be kosher restaurants. That the, the, the community would begin to understand our culture and, and that they would, they would have special community events not on Saturday but on some other day of the week so that we could participate. That local businesses would begin to cater to us. Not that we want to be catered to. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But it would change the atmosphere. Imagine what it would do to the Jewish community. What do you think would happen when the Jewish community in Dallas found out there was a kosher restaurant in Saginaw because there were so many Jews in Yeshua who lived there who were keeping kosher? It doesn't mean that they would convert to Yeshua-centered Judaism, but I guarantee you it would turn some heads. What do you think would happen if we just assimilate and we're all eating bacon cheeseburgers, but we're coming up here and talking about Jesus Christ at our Messianic synagogue? What do you think that, what effect will that have on the world? And my answer is nothing. It will change nothing. Even with our friends here at EBC, when I say that, 
you know, I know that's hard, but maybe in some little way, maybe not this year we can't do it completely because they don't know what they don't know and it is what it is. But can we try at least on a little level to try to get some of the hummets out of the building? They don't know what that means. But imagine if I wasn't observant at all and I didn't really care, I didn't give a flip as my dad used to say. And I say this is what everybody wants. But now I'm bringing them to the table and saying, listen, can we get rid of a little bit of hummets? And they're like, well, what does that mean, Rabbi? I say, well... You know, I know it's going to be hard. You'll have somebody to bring in homage, but maybe if we can try. I said, I said, maybe instead of your burritos that, that week, maybe our people can come in and cook shakshuka and serve it to your people on matzah. See, if we weren't observant, they wouldn't have any opportunity to learn what homage means. And it may not, they may continue to on their path and, you know, Baruch Hashem, but it may cause some of them to go, I want to learn more. But if we weren't observant, no effect. This is what I mean. At the end of the day, I'm not trying to win any arguments. Our shul is our shul and people who disagree with us, we accept their disagreement and we also recognize that their belief is completely inconsequential to who we are. And God, that's the way God made the world. My job is to encourage all of us to be observant and to learn what observance means, actually. And to be halakhically observant as much as possible. What does that mean? We encourage people to wear talit katan when they wear tzitzit. You can wear tchalit blue if you can get the kosher stuff. We do sell it, but you don't have to buy it from us. But you should wear tchalit blue and not, not any other kind of blue. If you don't have tchalit blue, wear white. If you wear a talit katan, you should wear a head covering. We're talking to men here. It doesn't have to be a kippah. It could be any kind of head covering. And you should wear it proudly at work. Many of you don't know this, but I was an executive recruiter before I became a rabbi. Your job cannot discriminate against you. Unless you have, work at a job where they have a prescribed uniform which may be a challenge, a police officer or something like that, but just a regular job where people come to work and they wear different things. You can wear a kippah. Nobody can discriminate with you. And they do. That's really, really bad for them. It's really good for you. Financially. <laughs> Pretty much your employer does not have religious options. If you go in there and tell them you can't work on Shabbat, they don't really have an option. They'll tell you they have an option. They'll tell you, well, we can't do that. You can't work here. And you say, okay, well, I have an attorney. You say, well, I don't want to play the hardball. Why not? Muslims do. Muslims do, absolutely. Problem is that believers generally just don't stand up for their faith. The employer will test you, by the way. They'll, when you tell them you can't work on Shabbat, they'll, they'll schedule on Shabbat. And you just tell them, I'm sorry, I can't work here. And they say, you're fired. And say, well, I'll see you in court. It's a religious thing. You tell them, I work six days a week. I work Sunday through Friday. Just can't work on Shabbat. Try it. If I'm wrong, tell me. I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> kosher lunch. We encourage people to eat kosher. I'll tell you a little secret. I want to get into a little bit of hawk. Are we okay on time? Are y'all okay? Oh, yeah. Okay, I just want to. All right, we're Jim. My wife and I eat, uh, eat, eat, we eat kosher, of course, and... Uh, and at our house, um, uh, and if you're watching online and if your congregation has a, a more stricter halakha, then that's great. We, we're pretty strict, if I can use that term, but we do allow uh, leniencies because we do have so many people who are coming in as converts, and so we do allow leniencies. Uh, at our home, we, we, everything we buy has to have a hexer on it, period, unless we do have an exception at our home I'm talking about. And uh, the exception would be if something is certified vegan. Something is certified vegan. We're, we were generally okay with it. We do buy we do buy Tillamook cheese, which is, doesn't have a hexer on it. Some Tillamook cheese does have a hexer, but I, I, my understanding is Tillamook is trying to get hexered on all their cheeses. But I don't know if that's going to happen anytime. But but they use uh, v, uh, vegetarian rennet, so we buy Tillamook cheese. Technically, Orthodox Jews can buy any kind of cheese. Doesn't have a hexer on it doesn't have to have a hexer on it because they don't necessarily do the rennet thing, which I found kind of interesting. I took a class in Dallas about that. But the reason that they have to have an extra on it because the reason it has to have a hexer is to be um, halab Yisrael, meaning that a Jew has been present during the entire process. 
The Halav Yisrael cheese means that a Jew has been present the entire process to ensure that no non-kosher milk has been incorporated into the mixture. However, in the United States, in the United States, it's against the law to use non-kosher milk in any kind of cheese. So many, many POSICs have said non-kosher, che- non-kosher milk, I'm sorry, would be like uh, pig's milk or any kind of other milk from a non-kosher animal, which I guess in other countries they use that kind of stuff. Um, but in America, it's illegal. So many POSICs have said in the United States, it does not have to be Chalab Yisrael because the, the FDA, it's forbidden for them to use that. So you presume that any cheese has been made with kosher animals. Uh, but, you know, when, when practical, we, we buy kosher certified cheese. My wife and I will only buy um, kosher wine, which is kind of an issue because there's a new wine out. I've never tried it, but it's called Griffon. <laughs> I won't buy it because it's not kosher. Technically, kosher, now, technically, kosher wine is kosher by nature. However, Mazel recently shared an article that said that some kosher wines are use, use uh, shellfish filters and non-kosher, non-kosher wines, excuse me, use uh, shellfish filters and that kind of thing. Yeah. Right, so the issue is that you're saying that vegan wines don't do that, of course. So I guess if you could find a certified vegan wine, maybe that would be okay. Right, the wine is not produced on Shabbat. Basically, the halakha says that you shouldn't drink wine that was handled by a non-Jew, a Gentile. Okay, non-Jew is a Gentile. For the fear that that Gentile has offered the wine up to their God, which is, has been a big historical problem forever. <laughs> Certified kosher wine ensures that that's the case. Now, the good thing is, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we have access to many great kosher wines. It's not all Manischewitz and Mog and David. <laughs> Thank God. So if you're in the Dallas Fort Worth area and you're looking for good kosher wine, Trader Joe's has good kosher wine. The biggest uh, selection is also at Total Wine. You can find great Israeli wines. Specs has some. Uh, Tom Thumb has some, of course. Seagulls, Addison. So in, uh, in our home, my wife and I will only eat at kosher restaurants. We do understand that that is a challenge for a lot of people because all the kosher restaurants are about 45 minutes from here. Um, so my wife and I will only eat at kosher restaurants with a few exceptions. And, and uh, these exceptions are uh, accepted in certain Orthodox settings. I, have, I do have Orthodox rabbis that I consult on certain issues. My wife and I will uh, go to some place like Jason's Deli and get a salad bar there, or like Ensalada and get salad. Um, Sometimes we will go uh, to uh, Jason's Deli or maybe some other sandwich place and we might get a tuna salad sandwich or we might get a a Mediterranean sandwich. It has basically all vegetables in it and hummus and so on, um, which are actually quite good. That's pretty much the extent of our eating out. If we are not eating at a kosher place, we're eating a salad or we're getting a tuna salad sandwich or we're getting a Mediterranean salad um, or sandwich. Uh, Beyond that, she and I have adopted the practice of only eating at kosher restaurants. Uh, We don't expect the community to do that at large. Um, However, we would just encourage people that if they do eat at a non-kosher restaurant, that that you would uh, just use discrimination. That you would, you know, look at the menu and um, generally speaking, uh, you know, uh, I would encourage you maybe to go for a fish dish or something like that, not chicken or beef. You, I would really encourage you, um, I mean, I feel strongly about this, that you shouldn't eat um, uh, non-kosher slaughtered meat, fowl or beef. But if you're still working on it and you're still, you know, you're growing into this and that's, you're, you're somewhere on the path, you really, 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 really should avoid non-kosher hamburger meat. And the reason for that is because non-kosher hamburger meat is going to have forbidden fats in it which um, should be offered on the altar. And uh, that's a particular problem. I don't think you should have beef at all. So if you're going to go out to eat, try to have fish, obviously kosher fish. Uh, speaking of that, we buy kosher fish, you know, certified kosher fish in the package and or we buy it at the kosher market. But the other day I was in Costco and I, I passed by this counter 
where they have non-kosher fish in the counter. But they just happen, and I didn't get it, but they happen to have uh, striped bass. But it was the whole fish, the head and everything. If you see the whole fish, you can buy that fish, even if it's on a non-kosher market, because you know it's the kosher fish that hasn't been processed. If it's a filet, not so much. But if it's the whole fish, yes. I didn't get it. We weren't really looking for that. But I thought about it. But I'm just saying that that's, that's an uh, uh, opportunity that you can take advantage of. Yes, Menashe. Yeah, oh, hold on, Menashe. We have a microphone. We want you to talk in the mic so we can record it on the video. Okay. Uh, Brookshire's, for me, it's been hard to find uh, you know, salmon, wild-caught salmon that was kosher. Brookshire's is the only place I found that has wild-caught salmon, and it's kosher texture. Okay, that's good. Costco, Costco, Costco has, has it. I'm sorry, go ahead and take it. I was going to say Costco has wild-caught salmon kosher. Let's yeah, go. they do. Uh, Varid has a question in the back, Zekin. Varid, in the back. Um, um, I was wondering about black kosher, because at some point um, I was under the impression that it was like um, grass-fed, organic, you know, the animal was roaming, but uh, now I've been told differently. And so um, I know that there's um, a question now about whether the organic meat that's out there um, and, you know, the animals are free range, um, is better for us than even like a glatt kosher. Yeah. Glatt kosher does not necessarily mean that it's uh, been treated any differently. What glatt kosher means is that the animal has been inspected for internal disease, specifically disease in the lungs, uh, but also in the other organs. The word glatt has come colloquial to mean that I'm really, really strictly kosher. It's kind of a misuse of the term, but if, if a Jewish person wants to convey that their home is really, really strictly kosher, they would say we're glot kosher. Not all meat is certified glot kosher. Now, there, there are uh, kosher certified meats that are organic. I know like Empire Chicken is organic, and I'm, I don't know about beef so much. The, you could go out and buy, for if, you're, if your goal is health reasons for organic meat, I'm talking about red meat, you could go out and buy, one could buy, of course, organic meat. The problem becomes in the way it was slaughtered. Now, the, the issue is in the United States is that most beef is slaughtered by using the uh, blunt force trauma to the head. Um, the problem with that is that that is akin to strangling because the animal is blunt force trauma to the head and then their blood coagulates in the body. They do drain the blood, but at what point? So it becomes like an animal strangled. All, I don't want to say all, but a lot of the fowl in the United States that's slaughtered, are, they are gassed, which is absolutely being strangled. So the issue is when you buy non-kosher meat, you're buying meat that has been not properly slaughtered. That's the challenge. So if you wanted to get certified organic meat, you can do that. It's gonna, it may be more expensive, I don't know, but you could, you'll probably have to order it unless you talk to Tom Thumb and, and ask. Yes, I can. I wanna say that at both Trader Joe's and South Lake, as well as the kosher Tom Thumbs have organic chicken. They don't have organic beef necessarily, but they do have organic chicken kosher. Uh, excuse me, kosher. Kosher certified. Yes, yes. Now, you could probably talk to Trader Joe's and ask them. I mean, mm -hmm. I've never really asked, but maybe they could order something. I don't know. You're talking about the beef. Talk about the beef side. Yes, yeah. You talk to them and know. Okay. Yeah, Mr. McDaniels has a question. This is like a talk show. It's like Oprah. <laughs> Yes, we uh, eat all organic uh, foods and done a little bit of research because we want the kosher as well as organic. And we found a, a site in a, a website called Hazon, H-A-Z-O-N, out of New York, I believe, which is organic, grass-fed beef, which is kosher. 
but you'd have to order it. They send it in dry ice. They pack it in dry ice. And poultry. And it's poultry as well. And we're going to bring that sheet down to you and let the, the Zakins look at it at one of their meetings to see if they wanted to share it with the group. Okay. But we're going to try it, I believe. I also was going to say that the Galat Kosher chicken is to die for if you haven't tried it. And they, <laughs> they, they, uh, they soak it in brine. Yeah. And you can, like my wife makes a special homemade mayonnaise topping that she puts on there and, and bakes it and cooks it. And it's just, uh, it's great for, for Arab and Shabbat. When, when was that Arab Shabbat? Yeah. <laughs> you have a sign Bruce the chicken off. Okay, Well, it, it, is, it is good. And, and you'll notice that my wife uh, did some research on this because we bought the uh, kosher fried chicken one time, which is these huge pieces, it's mouth-watering. And we were like, why are these pieces, they're like dinosaur pieces of chicken. Yeah. Well, the, the issue is that non-kosher chickens, and my wife would be able to tell you better, but they're, they're allowed to live for like six weeks and then slaughtered, but a kosher chicken must live for like nine weeks. And, and then it's not boiled because that could make it unkosher. This is why when you buy fowl, sometimes you have to pull feathers out of it because it's mechanically done, not boiled like non-kosher chicken because that can introduce bacteria and stuff. So you get a bigger piece, you get a bigger chicken and a fresher chicken um, but again, I want to remind everybody that eating kosher is about holiness, yeah. not health. Nothing wrong with health, but I just want to remind everybody it's about holiness. So if you want to eat healthy, and we all do, but you might have to take some extra steps because, you know, you can buy a kosher certified coconut cake. Woo, make you want to <laughs> preach. But, uh, you know... <laughs> So I want to say something else because I don't want to go too long. I don't want to belabor anything. But I thought I would mention a couple of, a couple of halakhic points. Um, and, and there's so much to talk about when it comes to halakha. But I just want to throw out a couple of things. So ceremonial, ceremonial hand washing. Ceremonial hand washing is done with a hand washing cup. The cup can be fancy or it can be just a, a plastic cup with two handles. But it's done in the morning when you first get up in the morning. Um, you can have the hand washing cup in your bathroom because halakhically the modern bathrooms are not like the old bathrooms. It was, you know, a hole in the ground, but, you know, modern bathrooms. You can have it in your bathroom. You can do the hand washing in your bathroom, but you should step out of your bathroom to say the baraka. Okay? When you first get up in the morning... Ideally, the, one of the first things you should do is, is do the ceremonial hand washing. Now, they say that you should not walk more than seven amos in your house, but some posts say that the entire house is considered seven amos, so you can walk you know, around your house. In my home, we have the hand washing cups in the restroom and also in the kitchen. Normally, I'll get up and go to my restroom, my bathroom that we have, and I'll do the hand washing there. This should be the first thing that you do as the days begin. The reason is because just like the priest would wash his hands as he's going into service for the king of kings into the mikdash, you should wash your hands before entering your day, which your entire day is to serve Hashem. We also wash our hands before we eat. Some people will wash their hands if, if they're going to eat before they eat bread, but it's praiseworthy to wash your hands before you eat, period. Okay? The, the baraka, the birkat tamazon, should be said after you eat bread, even if you eat bread as small as a piece, as an olive size bread. Uh, theoretically, you could just say, uh, uh, you, you wouldn't technically say birkat tamazon if you have, if you've eaten a meal that didn't include bread. Uh, but it's praiseworthy to say a baraka um, even after such a meal. You could even do a, a short baraka. You should pray before you eat. Um, you can say uh, the Hamotzi Lechem blessing before you eat. However, you should know, just to know, that that is a rabbinical commandment. Um, not that you shouldn't keep the rabbinical commandments, but you should know that praying after you eat is Torah. Praying before you eat is rabbinical. So if you're going to skip one or the other, God forbid, you should skip the first one, not the last one. So when we ask the question, did Messiah keep Halakha? He prayed before he broke the bread. He kept Halakha. So that's rabbinical. Um, yes? Uh, no, not necessarily. No, does, the question was, does it have to be the long version? It doesn't necessarily have to be the long version. At our house, we don't necessarily do the entire long version. For one thing, in the beginning, you have to have three men present 
to do it. So lots of times it's just my wife and I. So I will say the bracha. The bracha should be spoken ideally sitting down, by the way, um, and in a position that's... Uh, you're not reclining, or you know, you're not kicking back in your in your recliner, but you're in a in a, a mode of prayer, saying that. So, uh, any other questions? That was good. Any other questions on that? Any other questions? I saw a hand back there, in the back. Okay. So we have uh, we encourage men to pray the shakarit blessing, the shakarit prayer rather, with uh, tefillin. It should be noted, by the way, that tefillin can be worn any time while it's daytime hours. Traditionally, it's worn in the morning. The reason for that is because the body should be clean when you wear tefillin. So the, the theory is if you don't do it in the morning, you go out and you work, come back, you're sweaty, you wouldn't want to put tefillin on. If you come home from work, it's still daylight out, you didn't have a chance to wrap tefillin in the morning, you want to do it for minka prayer, it's still daylight, then you should take a shower, get out of the shower, wrap tefillin, say minka, um, and, and so on. Um, what are some other halakhic questions out there? I know you got questions. Yes. Oh, wait. Stand by. We're trying to make our online viewers happy. As I was running a little bit late this morning, uh-huh. I um, hopped onto the tollway. Yeah. And I was thinking, I was like, okay, this isn't actually ever changing hands, but is this something that Rabbi would say yes or no to. So I was actually going to ask you that at lunch, but... Yeah, yeah, you have toll charges. I, you know, that's a, that's a tough one because, um, uh, of course, people watching this wonder, you drive on Shabbat? Yes, we do drive on Shabbat. We don't think it's quite the same thing, but that's not the hit or there. The toll charge is different. Um, some people would say that you shouldn't do it because it's, it's a toll charge. Uh, However, the toll charges are acquired ahead of time. They're acquired ahead of time. If you've got the toll tag, it's already been paid. So really, it's, it's, you really already have, you have a thing that's already been paid. They're really taking out of something that's already been paid. So uh, people may disagree with me, and if you disagree, that's completely fine. Uh, I think it's okay for that reason. I wouldn't forbid it. Um, if you feel uncomfortable with that, that's perfectly fine. You know, Sar Shalom, if you want to rise to a more stringent level than we are as a community, I have no problem with that. Um, just don't look down upon somebody who is not quite so stringent. Just be, be, have a level of chen, have a level of grace with people. And maybe, you know, and if you can make, in a nice way, you can make your argument. And maybe, maybe we'll listen to your argument and, and, and acquiesce to it. But I think since it's already been deducted, they're pulling for something that's already deducted. Yes, ma'am. Um, the Hold on one second. Wait, wait, wait. Thank you. The um, prayers, the... Um, really. Like Shakari, yeah, Tamika, and, and then Marif. Marif, yes. Um, a lot of days I get up at 4, 4.15 because I have to go to work. Mm-hmm. How do I do those prayers... In between my day. Yeah. Well, Shakarit um, should be prayed at like sunrise, as the sun is coming up, you know, at dawn or what have you. But, um, you know, there's a principle within Judaism that is do what you can do. So if you are at work, if you pray them before you go to work, or if you're at work, you can pray an abbreviated Shakarit. Uh, actually, the most powerful time to pray is Minka, which is also happens to be the most difficult time to pray. The mornings kind of things are quieter, and you know we're, we're getting our day together. Normally, by the time Minka comes along, our day's in the full throes, and we've got this, and we've got dinner, and all those kind of things, and, and it's a bit more difficult. But if you'll notice in the Bible, the, most, the, the greatest miracles occurred at Minka time. And the rabbis even write about that, that minka is a, 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 a powerful time to pray. The minka, well, it varies from week to week, but generally speaking, from 3 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, generally speaking. Uh-huh. I live in Dallas. Uh-huh. Traffic. Um, 
How do how that's what that's what I'm asking. How do I do this, or should I just maybe take the prayers from the women's sidur, write them out, and just I guess while I'm writing, just pray them to myself or something, because sometimes I don't even get home till ten o'clock at night. Yeah, well, you could do that. The good thing is, as a woman, and I don't mean this any other way than what it is, is that you are more women are given more latitude. Okay. Um, for men, we would need to try to hollow out those times that we actually need to pray and, and, and pray with the congregation, whether it be in the spirit or otherwise. But my, my answer ultimately to you is that I would, I would recommend that you do what you can. That's the biggest thing. Do what you can, not to skirt by, but to do what you can. And prayer is important. That's how we take words with us. Rukashem. Bakashah. Any other questions? I think we're about to end. Well, I just wanted to say one thing for encouragement, mm-hmm. and that is, um, you know, around town and so forth, I'd always wear a head covering and always wear my ZZ out and this and that, but the one area that I did not do was work. And regarding to your, to your message earlier, and I don't know, two months ago, maybe almost three months ago, I just started doing it. Now I work in the office. I'm a controller, an executive there at the company. And so, you know, I, I had potentially a lot to lose there. And started wearing Just one day, just boom. Actually, Rabbi came the day before. And I was jealous. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I was like, I'm just going to start, just wear it. I'm just going to put a keep on my head and wear my ZZ out. And not one word has been said. Not one word. And in fact, I've been invited to board meetings that I was never invited to before to have it with the board and this forth so there's been no like oh we can't have him because he's going to embarrass us or by anything like that so just want to give that word of encouragement if that's something that you are thinking about that just one example of it's, it, there has been nothing said or, or done to me that would indicate that they're embarrassed or shamed or what in the world is he thinking or anything like that awesome sure. that's wonderful you know, that, that, that's, you know, the Yetzir Hara wants you to make you think that you'll be shunned or whatever. You won't be. Um, and if you are, who cares, really, right? Um, that's awesome. Well, I hope that these classes have been insightful and helpful. I hope that they've been encouraging. Um, yes, sir. Can you, uh, we have a question about glot. What is glot? Glot. Glot is, is a stringency of kosher it means that the animal has been inspected once it's been slaughtered. It's, the organs have been inspected, particularly the lungs, lungs, to see if there's any lesions in the lungs or if there's any disease in the lungs or in the other parts of the organ. Um, not all kosher slaughters are taken to that stringency. Nowadays, it seems like more and more that's becoming the stringency level. is becoming like common. Uh, if an animal is found to have disease or something like that, then it's it's a, it's sold to a non-kosher, uh, it's a non-kosher uh, butcher. One other thing, by the way, this popped in my mind because the other day we were at Costco, and uh, if you buy lamb chops at Costco, which I hope you don't, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be buying non-kosher meat anywhere. I hope you're not, but um, God forbid that you did that. The lamb at Costco is halal which means that that lamb had been offered to the false god of the Muslims. So just keep that in mind. That, and, and that's happening more and more and more and more and more. Somebody told me, I don't know if it's true, but I heard anyway that Tyson chicken is halal ultimately. So just keep in mind, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, you might investigate it. Don't take my word for it. And we've kind of bounced this question around to other people, but uh, we found certain cheese that'll have a, a kosher hexer and mm-hmm. a halal symbol on it at the same time. And we're told, well, you know, basically come to the conclusion that meats are offered up to their all to their gods, but not so much cheese and dairy products. But uh, how does that happen where you get a kosher hexer and a halal symbol? Well, you're, this, so that's a good question. So people have said that. They said, well, the, the meat's offered up, but the, the vegetables and the cheese, not so much. But I, I beg to differ on that. Uh, how does it happen? Well, I don't understand why... A kosher agency would certify it. I think that there's reasons for this. Probably the same reason that the Indian restaurant, which breaks my heart, the Indian restaurant in Dallas is kosher certified, but they've got all their idols in the window. 
Um, and I, I know of one, at least one Orthodox rabbi in Dallas. I asked about that, and I said, I, I won't eat there because of that. And he said, I won't eat there either. I, he said, I, I don't know how in the world they got a certification, but they did. Um, a couple of issues with halal and kosher. So if, if, for me, personally, if I pick up something that has a kosher symbol on it and a halal symbol on it, I will not buy it. I will not buy it. Uh, because I saw a video, it's anecdotal, but I saw a video some time ago where a man was preparing coffee beans that were going to be certified halal, and he, as he was preparing those offering that, that, that those coffee beans, he was chanting prayers in uh, Arabic to that false deity, um, and, and was talking about basically offering up. So I'm not convinced that there is not something to that. But the other, just from practical terms, if it has a halal symbol, it means that that company is paying that halal agency and that money is going to Hamas and that money is going to terrorists. So I don't want to, I don't want to contribute to that chain. And somebody might challenge me on that and say, well, how do you know that so-and-so brand's not doing that? Well, I don't, but this one I know for sure. All right? So why am I going to do that for sure? So I just don't. Rebbe and I, if we picked it up, it says halal on it, we put it down. There's too many other brands to not have that problem with. Tom's toothpaste is another example of that. But we can go to uh, uh, Market Street or, or what's the other one? Uh, uh, Sprouts. There's another Jason's. brand that I get. Jason's. There's another, some other brand. It's not Jason's that I get because I don't do the fluoride thing personally. But. So I can add to the, the toothpaste thing. Nope. The wait, 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 wait. I read, um, personally, I agree. It's, it's kind of funny that like if we're going to walmart the only toothpaste that has a hexer on it also has a halal certification on it there's upon investigating it there's um disagreement between different rabbis that that they about whether or not toothpaste must be kosher as far as what i read because some of them rule that since we're not eating it um that the the Dietary restrictions are specifically for stuff that's consumed. However, mm -hmm. still, you have to think, okay, well, what about it would possibly make it not kosher? And they say just if, if you can't get one that w within reason that, that, that doesn't have a texture on it, avoid, avoid ones that have like glycerin and stuff in them, mm -hmm. and you should right. be fine. If you're, you know, if you're more stringent and, you know, would prefer to have a hectured because it is coming in contact with your mouth, then there's that. But I just wanted to mention that I had found out that there's um, differences of opinions from different rabbis about whether or not um, halakhically toothpaste has to have a hexer on it. Right. Just, just That's good. Throw that up. That's good. But, yes. Just real quick, too. I have heard that. A lot of your like fast food type restaurants, I think uh, Burger King and some of these other ones are starting to offer halal food now, mm -hmm. and more and more going that way. You don't see certain restaurants making sure that there's kosher on the menu, but you're seeing halal on the menu. I think it's just uh, indication of the the population movement and the political movement that we're going towards in this country for the Muslim population. But yeah. I don't go to those kind of restaurants anywhere, especially now that we're eating kashrut. Right. But it's just a right. it's just a just a, something to mention. It is interesting when you look up the word halal in Hebrew, it means torn, it means beheaded. Yeah. In Hebrew, the word halal means halal. 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 Not halal. Halal. <laughs> Not halal. Not halal. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Easy, easy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Halal. <laughs> It means beheaded, torn, pierced. Wow. Wow. It's it's brutal. It's, it's it's very it's evil actually. And the word it, the word halal means to profane. Yeah, halal means to profane. Same same spelling, just different vowels. So when you really look it up in the Hebrew, it's not it's it's lotov, you know lotov. So there's more subjects of halakha stuff running through my mind, but. You know, these are things that we'll, we'll be able to, to, to teach over time. And as people are coming in and they're learning, it's a process. It's a process of learning. Um, you know, there's different things that we do and, and things that we, uh, uh, customs. And some, some is customs, some are, some are halakha. 
But again, I hope that these classes have been beneficial and been informative. We'll have them from time to time. Yes? There you go. All right, we got to go. We're ending it now. Thank you so much for your participation. I got the rabbit scene flag. So we love y'all. Shabbat Shalom.